health and the health co-benefits of low carbon policies. And his current research focuses on climate change mitigation, sustainable healthy food systems, and complex urban systems for sustainability. Please join me in welcoming Sir Haynes. It's a great pleasure for me to talk to you today about the burgeoning threat that climate change poses to human health, and also about the actions that we can take to reduce uh, climate change and protect human health. Let me start with this slide, which shows you how global temperature is increasing over time. It starts in 1880, which is when the reliable direct measurements of temperature uh, started. And you can see that there are five different records, and they all really show us the same thing, namely that temperature, global average temperatures increased by over one degree or so since 1880 that uh, those people born after 1980 have only experienced really temperatures that uh, are above the global average for that time series. And the five last years are the five hottest years on record. And it looks like 2020 is also going to be a very uh, hot year. This slide shows you the picture in August 2020, and it compares it with the uh, average between 1981 and 2010 degrees Fahrenheit. So what you can see is there's been pronounced difference between August 2020 and the average of the earlier decades. That's very pronounced, particularly over land rather than the oceans, which is what we'd expect. And you can also see it's very pronounced towards the Arctic, and which is obviously witnessing tremendous warming, and that's showing signs of that uh, through uh, the, the cryosphere. So for example, the Greenland ice sheet has shown a record annual uh, mass loss of over 500 gigatons, that's billion tons, in 2019. It's been declining for, as you can see, for many uh, years, but 2019 was an extraordinary year. And the right side of this picture also gives you a visual representation of, of the block of three gigatons of, of ice or water compared to the Manhattan uh, skyline. So that indicates the magnitude of these losses. So this is being driven by carbon dioxide. Uh, particularly, it's not the only greenhouse gas, but it's a very important one. Carbon dioxide is a long-lived uh, greenhouse gas, so it stays up in the atmosphere. 15% or more of it stays up in the atmosphere for longer than 1,000 years. You can see that the current um, average is over, it's now over 410 parts per million, and the highest previous concentration over a period of about 800,000 years was 300. So we've seen a very, very substantial increase in carbon dioxide, and that's one of the major forces driving climate change. It's not the only one. There are also highly potent short-lived climate pollutants, which are summarized in this slide. There's black carbon that comes from diesel exhaust, for example, or burning biomass for cook stoves, has local and regional effects. Methane, which stays up in the atmosphere for about 10 years, uh, is emanates from livestock, from landfills, from natural gas, from rice paddies. Tropospheric ozone, a secondary um, pollutant, formed from these complex interactions between these other different precursors, which has local and regional impacts and is also directly, of course, important for, for human health. And the hydrofluorocarbons that come from air conditioning and refrigeration. So all of these contribute uh, to climate change. So as the temperature increases, of course, risks also increase. And this slide just gives you a graphical representation of those increasing risks. You can see that as we go above one degree, 1 1.5, and then to two degrees, threatened ecosystems are under greater pressures, coastal flooding increases, extreme weather events such as um, extreme storms, very heavy precipitation events are also increased, coral reefs are dying off. And of course, many of these impacts have implications for human health directly or indirectly, like river flooding, effects on crop yields, and most directly, of course, heat-related morbidity and mortality. And unfortunately, at the moment, it looks as though we're going to exceed, well, we certainly will exceed on current trends, two degrees heating by the end of the century on the trajectory. At the moment, if all the uh, commitments made in the Paris Agreement are implemented, which this is an open question, then we're heading to about 3.2 degrees centigrade, that is, uh, increase in temperature over pre-industrial by late this century. So that is a major threat which goes beyond 
uh, really what's shown in this graph. And I think emphasizes the importance of keeping uh, climate change to under two degrees and hopefully 1.5 if at all possible. So I don't have time to go into all the um, potential impacts of climate change uh, on human health, but this slide summarizes some of them. And you can see that there's a whole range of exposure pathways ranging from the most direct, like extreme weather events and heat stress, to less direct, like the effects on water quality and quantity, effects mediated through ecosystems on food supply, effects on vector-borne diseases through distribution of disease vectors. And then very importantly, the, those effects mediated through social, socioeconomic systems, the effects on physical and mental health of conflict, perhaps, forced migration, increased poverty. The World Bank, for example, suggests that unless we take uh, positive action, definitive action, 100 million people, more, more people could be pushed back into poverty um, uh, over the next decade or so. And so these effects are mediated through a whole range of different pathways, um, and they lead to a range of different health impacts. This is um, uh, one example. It's the effect of increasing heat on labor productivity. And what you can see on the right side of this slide is the yellow areas are the areas of extreme heat, which gradually expand over time as the temperature increases. And you can see that the area exposed to these very extreme levels of heat during the hottest month, the summer month, that would prevent even moderate physical labor, even in the shade, really expand dramatically. And so by the time we get to about two and a half degrees, over a billion people are exposed to that sort of level of heat. This is probably conservative analysis. It doesn't take into account that many people have to work out in the open, like um, this uh, subsistence farmer, female subsistence farmer. And so the situation is actually substantially worse than that. And our current research is looking at the health effects of extreme heat exposures um, in um, pregnant uh, subsistence farmers. But it's not just in, in low-income countries, of course. It's also high-income countries uh, increasingly are affected by heat, have an impact, an adverse impact. And this is a recent paper by Drew Schindel and colleagues projecting forward the likely increase in heat-related deaths in the U.S., suggesting that with a high emission, high greenhouse gas emission future, there could be an extra 100,000 or so annually, even if you take uh, some account of the potential for adaptation. Obviously, one can adapt to some extent, but there are limits to adaptation. Um, and uh, that suggests that even in high-income countries, then the impacts can be very, very substantial indeed, and that's just the direct effect. But because heat is not distributed uniformly, there's the urban heat island phenomenon. This shows you the urban heat island effect in a very typical U.S. city by day and by night. You can see really a lot of fluctuation between different parts of the city, and it's important that, to note that green space reduces the, the heat island. To some extent, water does as well, particularly in the daytime. So there's a lot of variation, and you can get uh, variations in terms of degrees Fahrenheit, more than 10 degrees uh, within the boundaries of a city, and, and even bigger if you compare the city with the surround. And of course, it also prevents people cooling down at night, which we know is also a risk factor for death. So disadvantaged populations are more likely to be exposed to increased um, urban heat because they are, do not live in areas where there's much green space. Then there's the issue of wildfires, which has come into very sharp relief um, in the last few months, um, both in Australia uh, and, and in the US and other parts of the world. We've seen dramatic increase in wildfires. And recent evidence shows that these um, increased wildfire risks are due to climate change, not just due to changes in, in forest management in relation to climate change. The map shows you where there's been a change in the length of the, of the fire weather season, including the west part of the US. Uh, parts of Latin America, parts of Africa, and elsewhere. And the bottom shows you the increase in acreages burnt by U.S. wildfires, and notably that recent one in California, single fire amalgamating into over uh, one million uh, acres covered. Then we have the effects on, on crop yields, food crops, and the slide summarizes the likely effects of climate change on the productivity of food crops by mid-century and beyond. You can see that the red areas where there's declines in crop yields, staple crops, but also fruit and vegetables, no doubt. The green area shows you where there might be an increase in crop yield, but we don't know how long it will last for. And we don't know whether people living in low-income areas will be able to afford to buy food on the global market. 
And on the left, you can see that the number of undernourished people in the world has been on the rise since 2015, when it's reached its lowest point. Now it's going up, and the fear is that climate change may be contributing uh, to that. Vector-borne diseases, just give you one example, dengue. We know that the vector mosquitoes for dengue have already increased their vectorial capacity, their ability to transmit dengue by about 10% uh, as a result of the climate change that's already occurred. And climate change is expected to increase the proportion of the global population exposed to dengue from about 35% to over 50% uh, by later this century. So dengue is just one example of a vector-borne disease affected by climate change. But of course, it's not just physical ill health, it's also the mental health effects of environmental change that are of concern. There's this term, solastalgia, which has been coined by um, our mental health colleagues uh, called the distress caused by environmental change. And that's been documented in people suffering from farmers who've seen their livelihood destroyed by drought. And many studies, of course, have also shown that uh, as an increase in common mental disorders for considerable periods after floods. There's also some evidence of um, the direct effects of temperature change uh, on mental health. This is a, side by, uh, a study by Burke and colleagues, and it shows a correlation between um, historical temperature changes and suicide rates in the US and Mexico. So there are many pathways by which environmental change, climate change in particular, can have an effect on mental health. So let me now, in the latter part of my talk, really turn to a more optimistic picture with what that can be done about it. Of course, we can adapt to some extent, we have to adapt, but adaptation will have its limits. And we also have to mitigate climate change, reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to reduce the risks of climate change to human health and society more broadly. So what can we do about climate change? Well, our transport systems are inefficient, they pollute, they drive carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, our energy system as well. And our food system is a major contributor, contributing perhaps 20% of emissions, depending on where we put the boundary of the food system, but also driving biodiversity loss and pollution from nitrogen and phosphorus. So there are many policies which will both reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also benefit human health in the near term. And it's those that I just want to emphasize in the latter part of my presentation. These are the WHO figures for the deaths linked to outdoor and household air pollution. About 7 million uh, people die prematurely every year from both household and, and outdoor air pollution. Household air pollution mainly a problem, of course, in low-income countries. Ambient or outdoor air pollution is, is pervasive around the world, and the great majority of us uh, live in areas um, higher, of course, than the, the WHO standard for, for air pollution, and even that's probably too high. So you can see it contributes to major non-communicable diseases like heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but also to pneumonia and to some extent um, to lung cancer as well. So a recent study that we did published last year looked at the specific contribution of fossil fuel burning to these premature deaths and estimated using um, new disease specific hazard ratios from uh, over 40 um, cohort studies around the world estimated that um, there would be about there are about 33.6 million deaths annually that could be attributed to ambient air pollution from burning fossil fuels. Uh, about 190,000 of those are, are in the US. So, if we can decarbonize the economy rapidly, we can both prevent dangerous climate change, but also reap the benefits of reduced exposure to um, ambient air pollution, which causes so much ill health and premature deaths. So one of the reasons we're still burning fossil fuels, despite all the risk, of course, is that we don't pay the full economic cost of doing so. So the IMF, for example, has estimated that the energy subsidies, which they define as the gap between existing and efficient prices, which include the health and environmental costs of, of, um, of burning fossil fuels, are over $5 trillion a year, equivalent to about 6% of global GDP. And the health impacts, local pollution, and so on, is quite a major contributor to, to those costs. So obviously, if we paid the full economic cost, then that would radically, dramatically change the balance in favor of renewable energy. And re renewable energy is already falling in price quickly, but it would further accelerate the uptake of renewable energy. And only about 22% of greenhouse gas emissions are actually covered by carbon pricing. In most cases, that's, that's too low. But when we institute these changes, we need to think about the impacts on society. So. If we move towards carbon pricing, that has to be carbon pricing, which also supports the poor, doesn't place undue um, burdens on the poor. Uh, and in, in 
withdrawing subsidies, we also need to make sure that those subsidies are recompensed when they involve, for example, subsidies being given to the poor. But most subsidies are actually benefited, the middle classes particularly benefit from many of these subsidies. Certainly there's a real need then to withdraw these subsidies rapidly and institute proper carbon pricing. And then the food system, this is from the Eat Lancet Commission, reported last year, uh, and they suggested we could potentially prevent perhaps 10 to 11 million premature adult deaths a year by mid-century, by instituting uh, this kind of diet. And you can see that they advocate eating a lot more fruit and vegetables. None of us probably eat enough of those, or not many of us do. Whole grain, um, whole grain foods, less uh, ruminant meat, more nuts and seeds. And so uh, this diet um, was in some quarters a little controversial. As it does suggest quite major changes in diet. But it, uh, I think, does give us a very clear pathway to the future. If we combine this with reductions in food waste, more sustainable diets, uh, then we can keep the food system within planetary boundaries and improve health. Of course, it will be important to ensure, again, that these dietary changes um, are affordable. So far, they're not affordable for many people in the world. Uh, and also that we need to think imaginatively of ways of, of changing dietary behaviours in a way which is consistent with different cultures and different dietary patterns. Cities, are, of course, are a major opportunity spot because many of the greenhouse gases, about 70% of greenhouse gases, are emitted from activities driven by cities. And there's a lot of work on the health improvements that can follow from increased active travel and low carbon transport. We and many others have done work in that area. This slide just um, is a study we did some years ago looking at the benefits of getting the urban population of England and Wales walking and cycling like the population of Copenhagen, which, as you probably know, has very uh, strong active travel policies. And it shows you the costs averted to our national health system, national health service. You can see that these um, uh, grow over a decade or two, and they're really quite substantial, amounting to about 25 billion US dollars over that period, by the, from the reduction in diabetes, um, heart disease, and other conditions. Also, we, we know increasingly that uh, access to green space is important for physical and mental health. It's summarized on the left side of this slide from our colleagues at IS Global in Barcelona. The dark uh, script is where there's strong evidence and the gray is where there's um, further studies are needed. But you can see there's quite an array of uh, <clears throat> evidence and, and uh, potential health outcomes that can be uh, improved by access, affordable, secure access to green space. And in Barcelona also, they've undertaken this interesting experiment of what they call super blocks. So they've amalgamated city blocks. Um, they've stopped through traffic. They've increased the growth of, of trees and vegetation in those blocks. And uh, if they could scale that up to the city as a whole, then they've estimated there could be substantial benefits from reduced air pollution, improved physical activity, and improved mental health. And then finally, the health care system, because we have to get our own house in order. As health professionals, we're beginning to understand thanks to the wonderful work of healthcare without harm, that uh, the healthcare system itself is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. If it was a country, the global healthcare sector would be about the fifth largest emitter on the planet, about 4.5% of emissions, something of that order, about 10% uh, in the US. Uh, the National Health Service in England has recently committed to net zero emissions by 2040 for direct emissions. The direct emissions are shown on the right side of the slide, from fossil fuels, the scope one emissions, the direct emissions like anaesthetic gases and fossil fuels uh, on site. The um, indirect emissions from electricity purchased in and the indirect, indirect emissions from supply chains. So medical devices, uh, business services, business travel, uh, waste, pharmaceuticals and so on. So in order to decarbonize the health system, you have to work not just in your own locality, but also with your suppliers to support them to decarbonize their supply chains. And the health professions are going to have a very important role in pioneering and leading some of these decarbonization initiatives. So finally, in conclusion, I think there are also very major opportunities to act on the global stage. This is just one of them. It's called the Race to Zero. It's uh, an unprecedented uh, alliance of businesses, over a thousand businesses, 450 cities, many investors, regions, universities, over 500 universities, and 120 countries 
committed to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050 at the latest. In order to keep the temperature below 1.5 degrees centigrade, we will need to decarbonize 7% or more per year uh, from now. Uh, but uh, we, that means we need also to keep the global economy within this net zero boundary by 2050. So we need to act quickly, and increasingly the voice of the health professionals is going to be key in motivating other key actors to make changes. By making case, the case that climate change is not just a threat to the environment, it's a threat to our health and the health of future generations. But as I've indicated, there's much that can be done to reduce these risks and to improve health in the near term by rapidly decarbonizing our economy. Thank you very much. <clears throat>